Welcome to the Grace Abounding Broadcast, sponsored by the Congregation of the Shreveport Grace Church in Shreveport, Louisiana. My name is Ken Weimer, and it is my privilege to minister the Word of God for you today. May the Lord Jesus Christ be praised and exalted through the message preached, and may He, by His Spirit of grace, grant ears to hear to each one He came to save, and ransomed by His shed blood on the cross. Take your Bibles and look with me in 1 Peter chapter 5. Just sung about God's marvelous grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. And here Peter concludes his epistle with this benediction, this prayer for these to whom he is writing. In verse 10 saying, But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while. David spoke of suffering for righteousness' sake, and that's really what these were suffering for. If they had fallen in line with the work religion of their day, there would have been no suffering but for righteousness sake. In other words, the righteousness established and procured and applied by Christ at the cross. It was for that righteousness that they were suffering because it stands against works religion, it stands against man's righteousness. And although we may not know today the same sort of maybe physical suffering that some of these have known. I believe that any that truly God has revealed his grace in will take the same stand for Christ's righteousness. They're going to know opposition. They're going to know isolation. It's going to affect association, friendship, the way we go about business, the way we go about worship. But know that you're not alone. As it says here, after that ye have suffered a while, make ye perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's what it's all about. It's not about our comfort. It's about God's glory. And then he says, by Sylvanus. Now that's a uh, Another form of the word silent. Remember reading the book of Acts about Paul and Silas. Well, here we find Silas here mentioned by Paul. Not a whole lot said in the scripture about him, but in every reference you find him referred to as a faithful brother. Sometimes that's the best kind, isn't it? The quiet, faithful brother that stands with one of the Lord's servants and prays for him, supports him, helps him encourages them. And it seems here that Peter, as he was, as Silas was a friend to Paul, he was a friend to Peter. They preached the same message, preached the same gospel. And Peter, having crossed paths with this one Silas, handed him this letter that we're reading here in First Peter and said, wherever you go, take to the brethren that are scattered and read it to them. Have them read it. That's what this is, by Sylvanus, Silas, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose. I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. And then it says the church that is at Babylon. Babylon was a, a name that was given for Rome at that time. So there's an indication that Peter was at this time at Rome, but he says the church that is at Babylon, Rome, elected together with you, salute you, and so does Marcus, my son. Why was that such an important statement, elected together with you? Well, just the name Roman, Rome, 
brought up all kinds of evil thoughts in the minds of Jewish believers. A despicable place. And yet Peter is attesting to the fact that even there, in that seed of ungodliness, God had his elect, those that were chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world, for whom Christ died. And Peter was enjoying their fellowship as the Lord had brought him, as the Spirit had brought him to the Lord. And so doth Marcus. Marcus, Mark. Remember John Mark? Paul and Barnabas split up over him. He was young, immature, and Paul just didn't want to have anything to do with him. And an impacted. Yet we find even in Colossians where Paul later says of John Mark that he is profitable to him in the ministry. And here Peter refers to him as his son. Marcus, my son. The Lord uh, used this John Mark later on in his life to write the gospel according to Mark. Same John Mark. <laughs> it's a reminder how quickly sometimes we might write off some people. And yet in the Lord's goodwill and providence, he's purposed to bless them and bless his people through them. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity, a kiss of love. This is a, a way of greeting each other in, in that part of the country. I know in France and some other parts, even in Africa, this is practiced. When you see somebody, you give them a kiss on each side of the cheek. And different places have different customs with regard to that, but he's encouraged them to show affection one for another in Christ. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan is a defeated enemy. There's no question. Christ in his death upon the cross crushed his head. That's where the venom of a serpent is. It, it was fulfillment of what was revealed back there in Genesis 3.15 all the way back in the garden. That serpent seed would bruise his heel, which he did through temptation and suffering, but that the seed of the woman would crush his head. So Satan is defeated with regard to the Lord's people. In other words, he cannot retain any that the Lord has redeemed. He cannot retain them in blindness, cannot retain them in darkness, though he would. And so know that when God is pleased to reveal Christ in the heart of one of his, Satan still has an idea. This battle's ongoing. He still has an idea that he can have them back. That's his objective. If he could, he would. But thankfully, there's one stronger than he, the Lord Jesus Christ. He, it says there in John, of all that the Father's given him, he'll not lose one. And yet, as we see here in verse 9, there is a resistance in the faith. It's not resisting according to the flesh. Some people say, well, the way to defeat Satan is to start a fasting program or join hands with people in prayer. And they look to the arm of the flesh. Notice it says here, whom? Resist steadfast in the faith, or in other words, in faith object. If we hear the gospel, that's really what we're doing. We're resisting steadfastly any attacks of Satan or advances of Satan to hear Christ exalted and lifted up, to hear of him crucified, to hear of that great work that he's accomplished, to hear of that sure salvation that he's accomplished. That's the ground and standing of everyone that the Lord is redeemed. But know that we'll be attacked. Know that the same afflictions, Peter says, are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. This isn't something that's particular just to a certain group of believers, but it's to be expected by any that are, are the Lord. And so that links us then to verse 10, but you see that? But the God of all grace. Christ said, you shall have tribulation in this world, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's what I want us to see here. The God of all grace. How all of God's own are objects of his grace. When it says here that he's the God of all grace, I believe there are four things 
that we can conclude. If you'd like to write these down, these are some thoughts that I had in studying this. But for him to be the God of all grace, first of all, it means he's the source of all grace. In other words, if there's grace to be had, it's going to be God given it. And I know I would love just to be able to leave it at that, but in this day and age, you just have to keep explaining and explaining and explaining. That's why in Scripture, it refers to the true grace. A little later on, verse 12, Peter refers to the true grace of God wherein you stand. That it supposes a false grace. What is a false grace? Well, it's a hybrid grace. It's a grace that's mixed with works and, and grace. And that's, that's where most people feel comfortable in talking about the grace of God, that God has his part in it and man has his. But dear friends, uh, when it says here he's the God of all grace, what that means is he's the source of all grace. In election, what is the one thing that you can point election to? His grace. It's not God looking down and seeing who would believe and then choosing them. No. It's his grace. And our justification, we've been justified before God. It's on one basis alone. His grace. He's the source of all grace. By his grace. Redeeming grace, he's justified every one that he's chosen by the work of Christ. Pardoning grace, our sins are forgiven. It's not based upon anything that we do. It's all based upon his grace in Christ Jesus. He's the source of all grace. But secondly, and this is tied to it, he's the giver of all grace. When it says, but the God of all grace, now, some people get discouraged. Uh, they say, well, if, if it all from him, why even approach him? Why even pray? Why even look to him? Well, because he's the giver of all grace. The God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. How is it that any are brought to Christ? It's because God has given them that grace to come. Faith, what is it? It's a grace. It's not something you work up in yourself. It's a grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith is the fruit of that grace. Hope. Hope in the Lord. How? By God's grace. He's the giver of grace. You say, I can't. Obviously you can't. By his grace. If God be pleased to grant you his grace, you will. Hope in the Lord. Hope in the Lord. Love. Faith, hope, and love. What's love? The grace. There's none of us here that could ever love God as he set forth in this word. Our flesh is at enmity with him. But to love him in truth and to love the truth regarding him, that's a grace. Here's the reason to pray and to hope and to believe because he is the God of all grace. And faith, hope, and love that we're commanded to in scripture, these are all fruits of his grace established by Christ. But here's the third thing I'd have you to see. For him to be the God of all grace, that means he's the sustainer of all grace. He not only gives it, he sustains it. I don't want you to think of grace just as something that's given here in, at a point in time and then that's it. Now you're on your own. <laughs> no, he's the sustainer of all grace. Whether for salvation, you know that's, Scripture passage in Ephesians 2, 8, it says, For by grace are ye saved. The tense of that word, are ye saved, means you've been saved and you're kept in that state of salvation. For by grace are ye saved through faith. It's that same grace that gives you that faith that not only to look to Christ at the point of regeneration, but to continue to look to him. To whom coming? looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I hope you see the need to look to Christ as much right now, this moment, as you did when God gave you grace to believe in the beginning, because that's what grace does. That's that sustaining grace of God, whether for salvation or for suffering. Every one of us in our lives right now, it, in some measure, in some fashion, is facing some sort of temptation, or opposition, or affliction, 
that left to ourselves would most certainly drive us away from Christ. I don't believe that these are just moments that we go through. I believe every day living in this world, there are those very situations that we're put in, that we face, that but for the sustaining grace of God, we would go the way of all flesh. You say, why haven't they? Why do I keep coming back? Why do I have a desire in my heart to hear once again this gospel? The grace of God. The grace of God. That's his sustaining grace. You notice here Peter says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ. That calling, that's a special call. The call of the Spirit, whereby the Spirit in time reveals Christ in the heart through the gospel. And causes you to see him as the Savior, the surety, the representative, Christ our righteousness. That's the glory, the eternal glory of God by Christ Jesus. But notice, after that ye have suffered a while. Look at these four things that this sustaining grace does. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle. I like that. You say, make perfect. I thought we were made perfect in Christ. Yes, that's, that's the truth of justification by God, already established and applied in Christ through his life and death. But here, this word perfect is not referring to our justification. You cannot be made any more perfect than you are already in Christ Jesus in your ground and standing before him. But this word literally means in maturity. The word perfect here means to mature. What is that? Well, that's to grow in grace in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What uh, Peter refers to in his second epistle over here in Second Peter 3 and verse 18. Is there a growth in grace? Absolutely. Now, in my position, in my standing before God, I cannot be any holier than I am in Christ. That's how God sees me, just as his son. But in my experience, what I know in this flesh, I'll tell you, there's room for growth. Just like that's why Scripture refers to the new birth. That's like being born as a child. But as time goes on, as you hear this glorious message of Christ, there's a growing as it says here, in grace, 2 Peter 3.18, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That word and there can also be translated even. And I believe that's the sense here. It's not that there's a growth in grace and then beside that, a growth in knowledge of our Lord. Both go together. As you grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's going to be a growth in grace. That's why we need to hear him preach. That's why we need to hear his work exalted and set forth because in that God grants that grace for each day and each moment to grow but don't think of grace as a as a position as, as, as if it's a promotion growing grace you know to grow in grace really what you're growing in you're growing in your need of Christ as you get along in life your need of Christ should become greater and greater more so than it was when Grace caused you to believe at the first. That's what it is to grow in grace. Growing in grace, we approach all the more often, I would hope, the throne of grace. Find grace to help in time of need. Is your need growing? Your need of Christ growing? I hope so. I hope so. I'll tell you, the Lord has ways of making it grow. When we get our thoughts too much on this world and too settled in the comforts of this life, he's going to bring affliction. Some of you are knowing some affliction right now. Deep trouble. You say, what's it all about? Grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make you perfect. Mature. Have that entire dependence upon him. That word means to render sound and fit. That's what comes through exercise, isn't it? Bodily exercise. It's goal to be toned and fit. Well, consider affliction that the Lord brings. That exercise. If it weren't for that, we wouldn't exercise ourselves spiritually. We'd just grow old and fat. The purpose of it is to 
cause us to grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. Make perfect. But secondly, it says here, the sustaining grace to establish. Every one of these words is important. There's not one of these here that's just here to fill the sentence. Establish. That means to render your mind and heart constant and firm. A double-minded man is unstable. It causes their minds to be turned away from themselves, from any confidence in the flesh, and to be stayed upon him. You cannot be any safer and more secure already than you are in Christ, in your position before God. There's no question, but in your mind and heart. <laughs> oh, how we waver. I'm so thankful that my salvation doesn't depend upon my faith. There's times when it's so weak, I wonder if there is that. But I'm thankful that Christ is the surety of my salvation. But as learn of him, even through the afflictions that he brings my way, and they are ordained of him. Don't forget that. Don't think that you can talk about secondary causes, Satan or the world and circumstances, but they're secondary causes. There's one who orders them, and that's the Lord himself. You know, I've read one time a story, and this is a good story for kids to remember, of some kids that were outside of a the window of a elderly lady and they they were playing and all they got up close and heard her in there praying and she was in dire straits she was asking god to send her some food so the kids ran off thinking this would be a funny little thing to do and so they went and grabbed some bread that they had at their house and they came and dropped it through the window next thing you know they heard her thanking the lord for the bread that he'd sent they thought well this is crazy so they knocked on the door and they told her they said god didn't bring that bread to you we did and she said well Children, you may have brought the bread, but God sent it. And I thought, that's a good way to look at things in life. You know, different things that come our way. It might be Satan that's brought it. It might be an acquaintance that's brought it. Whatever it is, but I know this, God sent it. The purpose of establishing how often we're unstable in our hearts and frame of mind. But I'm so thankful the rock doesn't move. God's planted you on that rock. The rock doesn't move. A couple of weeks ago, I put that story in the bulletin about the minister who came to see that dying lady and asked her, are you thinking? Are you thinking? He could see that in her emotions, she was in somewhat of a mental strait, as you can imagine. Facing death is not an easy thing. There's going to be instability. But after he'd asked her the third time, she said, sir, how could I be thinking when I'm standing on the rock? That's a good thing. That's, a, that's something to remember. Thirdly, it says here, strengthen. This is sustaining grace. Strengthen. What does strengthening suppose? Weakness. <laughs> Don't ever get beyond thinking yourself strong. That's why the Lord brings affliction, to show that we are weak in ourselves. This is a good thing, to know our weakness, if it brings us to bow at Christ's age. It supposes feebleness of mind, body, and soul, but that's what God's sustaining grace does. It makes strong in one's soul. Then, fourthly, settle. And again, I remind you, you, you cannot be any more settled than you are in Christ. If he's redeemed you, and his spirit has called you, as it says here, unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, you're already settled in your position with Christ. But even before that, Look at David, what his last words were. What was his hope? As he looked all around him, his family and everything about him in his last days, there wasn't anything in those situations to give him any confidence. But his hope was in that eternal, everlasting covenant, which he said, ordered of God and sure. He's the glory of all grace. Notice here, but the God of all grace who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Whose glory is it? His. It's to his glory. It says in verse 11, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. You know what that word dominion means? I had somebody say one time, as much as you preach on God's sovereignty, I sure don't see that mentioned that much in scripture. <laughs> well, there's a lot of synonyms for it. Here's one of them. And to him be glory and what? Dominion dominion that means lord master 
master of it, whose kingdom rules not only in who will be part of that kingdom, but circumstances to bring sinners into that kingdom, establishing them through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this is how grace is dispensed. It's sovereign grace. It says here, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen means so be it. So be it. Don't want to add anything to it. Don't want to take anything from it. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. As you see here in verses 12 through 14, here's a reminder that all those scattered throughout the world, often in small groups, the Lord's sheep, because that's really who he's referring to here. And in verse 2, the chapter started off with feed the flock of God which is among you. That's who this letter is written to encourage the Lord's sheep, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, sanctified by the Spirit under the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't get discouraged with small numbers. This gospel has a way of dividing. People come and sit and listen for a while, and then they're going to go their way. Glorious day to be of that number around the throne, singing, worthy is the lamb that was slain, not one missing. A glorious throng that no man can number. But for now, this is scattered, small, and in the world's eyes, a desperate lot. But I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. To be Christ, to know him in truth. But here's a reminder that all those scattered throughout the world, often in small groups, yet we're not alone. We're not alone. Although we're not part of any religious organization, we certainly don't like any fellowship. I had a neighbor stop and ask me that the other day. He said, now, what are you all a part of? What organization are you a part of? <laughs> Not a part of any organization. But I trust truly a member of Christ's body. That's what's essential. And that's why Peter here mentions these few. Verse 12, Silas, Silvanus. Paul's faithful companion, when Peter met him in his travels, he identified with him, sent this epistle as a faithful minister of the gospel. As it says here, the true grace of God wherein you stand. That's an interesting verb as well, wherein you stand, wherein you have been made to stand at one point and continue to stand, unmoved, what it is, silent. Verse 13 is interesting. You notice the word church is an italic. Actually, in the original, it says she that is at Babylon elected together with you, saluteth you. It may refer to the church who's the bride of Christ. That's why the translators put it here. Some say it could refer even to Peter's own wife. Uh, to me, that's an interesting point, uh, particularly with religion today that has founded their whole religion on the fact that Peter was the first pope and was never married. You know that Christ, in his earthly ministry in the book of Mark, it says he healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. And some, for that reason, think that this may be just Peter's tender way of referring to himself and the wife that the Lord has given. She that is a Babylon, elected together. I'll tell you, it's a great blessing when the Lord is pleased to reveal Christ to both husband and wife, elected together. It's a blessing. It doesn't have to be. There's many that, in which case it's not. If it is, it's all of God's grace. She that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluted you. And so does Marcus, my son. Marcus, John Mark, as I said, the cause for Paul and Barnabas was splitting up originally, but now profitable. And one that the Lord is pleased to bless. Greet you one another with a kiss of charity. There's no reason why the Lord's people need to be at odds with each other. Where there's the grace of God, there's affection. You've been listening to the Grace Abounding Broadcast brought to you by the Congregation of the Shreveport Grace Church in Shreveport, Louisiana. We meet at 2970 Baird Road and invite you to join us each Sunday beginning at 10 a.m. For more information, please visit our website at www.shrevegrace.org or call 318-687-4943.
please plan to join us again next week.